in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen amen psalm number 131 131 lord my heart is not proud now are my eyes haughty i do not busy myself with great matters with things too sublime for me rather i have stilled my soul like a weaned child to its mother weaned is my soul israel hope in the lord now and forever let us pray god our father we thank you for your presence with us this evening as we have gathered together online at saint paul's bible college to learn about the psalms the psalm that which we heard just now psalm 131 teaches us as how david in the prime of his life experienced himself as a little child who was not haughty but was not busy with the great matters but surrendered himself totally learning the book of psalms being inspired by the psalms we may continue to imitate the author david by being a leading a life in simplicity and humility according to your will bless each of us present here that this learning may be a effective one for each of us we make this prayer through our lord amen good good evening to you good evening everyone and a warm welcome to the newcomers and some people have joined those recently and a hearty welcome to all of you as we mentioned in the prayer the text that we are going to discuss today is the book of psalms and this is the 10th lecture in the second series of the 24 lectures and when we have attended the last time like we have taken a slightly different model so that those who have attended the previous lesson on psalms also are inspired by this new lecture and a special note of welcome to all the people who have been attending as part of the curriculum and you have been doing a great job both online and postal writing the assessment on time congratulations to you so continue the good work and as we have these videos in our on our youtube channel this video also will be available and usually this lecture is held on the last sunday of every month but last month and this month we have anticipated on account of our meeting reasons. So thank you for your kind understanding. Now let me share my screen with you. I hope you are able to view my screen. Yes, brother. Well okay, good. Thank you. So as our regular program, this will be first, our lecture will be about an hour. And this is a relatively known subject. We'll see how it proceeds. Good. I have titled the subject as it is in the handbook, Psalms. The outline for this evening is sixfold. Number one, general introduction. So at the outset, we'll be trying to see what is the meaning of the name, the book of Psalms, and what is the meaning of the word in the, each poetry in Hebrew, then who wrote it, when was it written, and the circumstance with which the Psalms were composed will be discussed in number one. Then in number two, we will discuss some key elements about Hebrew poetry, like what are the literary elements the psalms employ to convey a message third one we'll see a uh, quite a number of psalms to understand their background and to understand what type of category it belongs to number four how these psalms are being used earlier and now in the christian tradition and we'll have a discussion on psalms that are difficult to understand for example in psalm 137 where these people of israel recall about their Babylonian exile. In a sentence they say, happy are those who beat the children on the wall. 
So it's a really very cruel to imagine such a situation where the little babies will be thrown on the wall and be killed. And uh, like this type of Psalms, how do how did they enter into the Bible? Because it's scandalous to the reader. And how do we make sense of this as God's word? That would be number five. Then finally, the theological significance of the entire book of Psalms. So with this outline, let's get into number one, the general introduction. So in English, we have this book titled as Psalms. This particular name Psalms comes from Salmoi in Greek. So Salmos is a singular from the plural Salmoi. But in Hebrew, it is Mismor. So from the Greek word, we are getting the name Psalm. But the Hebrew word for Psalm is Mismor. So in Hebrew Bible, suppose you, you buy a Hebrew Bible and see like Mismor Hadavit, the David Psalm. So this is how it is written, Mismor. It's a Psalter. And by Mismor, so what is the meaning of Mismor means? Usually it is defined as a song with a stringed musical instrument. So when we talk about musical instrument, like today we have a lot of musical instruments and with our electronic system being upgraded, we have everything in our electronic. But earlier they had three types of instruments. Number one, stringed instrument. Number two, like a, with the hide, the animal's hide, the kind of a tabla, drum, so that's with the, the skin of animals. That's made by the skin of animals, the second type. The third one is the wind instrument, like flute or fiddle. So these types of instruments are called wind instrument. Why is this particular uh, psalms were always with the musical instrument? So number one, it's for a liturgical reason, like it was uh, consuming less energy because earlier they have to sing the song as they play the music instrument. So the, or suppose a player of a vocal instrument may not be able to sing. So they opted for a musical instrument. And besides that, in a way, it stands close to your heart when you sing with a musical instrument. And there, there is a connectivity, like the strings are pulled and attached. So theologically, they say, as the string is pulled and tied between two ends, our hearts are pulled between our end and God's end. So this is how we can theologically understand when we play or when we sing, when we read a psalm, our gods, our hearts naturally get connected to God. And there are three types of uh, psalms we can say. At the outset, there are some liturgical psalms or liturgical songs or liturgical hymns. Primarily, these psalms were sung in liturgy, Hebrew liturgy, Jewish liturgy, synagogue liturgy or temple liturgy primarily and there are some songs which were sung during paraliturgical celebrations so what is a paraliturgy so liturgy is an official a liturgy like for example we have sacraments and sacramentals and sacraments have to do with something liturgical sacramentals have to do with something paraliturgical which means they are not really officiated by a priest but still it's a popular piety which is similar to or which goes in line with the liturgy. That's like para liturgy. For example, pilgrimage. Like during Lenten time, we go to different pilgrimages. Different parishes organize different pilgrimages to either shrines or they gather together in the headquarters or in the cathedral. So it's a kind of a pilgrimage. Or there are novenas, like for Joseph, we are beginning tomorrow, novena, or different novenas. And these are all para liturgical celebrations. So one of the paraliturgical celebrations of the ancient times was pilgrimage. The people of Israel were going as a pilgrimage, in a pilgrimage to Mount Jerusalem. So they were living in a low land and Jerusalem was on high hills, the Zion, Mount Zion. So they would always go up. That's why they are called songs of ascent. Like ascent means you go up. Last week on the second uh, Sunday of Lent, we had our Pope Francis beautiful apostolic letter, that's Lenten message, which was given there, he uses the word ashesis, which means ascent. Like he tells that our hearts are always on the rise together with that of Jesus. 
and more or less these pilgrim songs in fact tell that we need to go up not only to god but also go up in our own lives thirdly there are some existential songs for example the lord is my shepherd so though it could have been sung in a liturgical context or it could have been used in a pilgrim context however no purpose is mentioned in the book so these songs are primarily songs that talk about human existential nature or human existence for example david finds himself such a loss and he feels he thinks that god is my shepherd and how does he get that particular idea shepherd he himself was a shepherd so in a way david attributes a quality of his own life to god and sing that beautiful king him the lord is my shepherd a different song for example the by the rivers of babylon we sat down and wept or when we say 121 when we begin from our home we sing as a song of journey or psalm 91 when we are at home and especially during the pandemic time many were saying that let us pray this psalm where it is that god will keep you away from all the plagues so this type of assurance psalms are not necessarily temple psalms not let us say necessarily paralytical psalms but they are existential psalms and when we consider the entire book of the bible psalms the book of psalms comes under wisdom literature so like we have different books pentateuch the first five books historical books like first samuel second samuel then we have prophetic literature like isaiah jeremiah ezekiel then we have wisdom literature this particular book of psalms belongs to the category called wisdom literature so many people ask why the book of psalms has to become part of the wisdom literature so the reason is very simple many psalms talk about the torah or the law so since the law the psalms talk about the law and what is the ultimate aim of law to give wisdom to human persons so that way one who follows the law or one who follows the torah one who reads meditates and practices it becomes a wise person and when these psalms since they advocate this particular type of torah wisdom these psalms are called are or become part of wisdom literature good we go to number 4 and there there are 150 psalms in our catholic bible but there is a problem in numbering for example you go to church on mass and you go when we come to our home we take a bible the priest in the mass he reads the lord is my shepherd psalm 22 1 and you come home and you read it is psalm 23 1 so now the difference like how do we understand the difference the priest said in the mass the lord is my shepherd psalm 22 1 but you come home and you read it is psalm 23 1 so how do we reconcile the differences or from where this numbering difference comes often this question is asked because even uh, in scholarly articles you will find like 23 1 in bracket 22 1 like which, which means simply means there are two versions the first version is masoretic text that is the hebrew bible original hebrew bible has its own numbering then when jerome uh, jerome translated the biblical scholar translated into latin and called it vulgate ulgata he divides psalm number 49 into two and there because of that there is a there is a congruence then also the the psalms which were available to for translation and he combined or he combined the few psalms and he divided a few psalms that's why we have this differing number and why the church has taken vulgate into the missal roman missal but in all other bibles we have this regular masoretic text because vulgate is the official translation of the roman catholic church and that is why the numbering that we follow also is according to this particular version of saint jerome so when you see the difference next time we just you remember jerome because of jerome's vulgate we have one version of numbering in the roman missal and another version in all other bibles coming to the last argument in first the first section who is the author or who are the authors so first one is we need to understand ascribed author actual author for example 
we say Shakespeare. William Shakespeare writes Othello. He is an actual author of Othello. And later we have Charles Lamb. What Charles Lamb does, he takes the stories of Shakespeare and writes as if Shakespeare has rewritten them. So there Charles Lamb in fact ascribes the role of Shakespeare and rewrites Shakespeare's play. So what is the implication? The implication is one person is the real or actual author. The other person either ascribes on himself or herself or somebody ascribes that status to a particular person. So when we talk about David, in a few Psalms, we have like Psalm 34, Psalm 23, Psalm 51. We have a, an explicit reference. This is the Psalm of David. So which means we can more or less say the actual because there are some elements that that correspond to the composition of the psalm. For example, Psalm 51, where we read this particular psalm was sung when David or after David committed adultery with Bathsheba and being warned by Prophet Nathan or by God through Prophet Nathan, he sings that psalm. So which means we know that there is that, that particular thing happened in the life of David and we are able to able to co correlate that. And it's Psalm 34 also. It's a very beautiful psalm where, in fact, that's, uh, David's sons are trying to kill David. And in order to escape from the son who was trying to kill, David becomes like a like a mad person, like a lunatic person. He behaves in, presen in the presence of the king and he's chased out of the presence. So that particular event is in the, in the book of uh, the second Samuel. So there, from when we compare the events like that, we are able to say like, these songs or psalms must have been really sung by David. That's one thing. But there are some songs that are ascribed to David, which means since David was a singer or he had composed many songs, so it was very easy that others also would compose in his name so that the songs will become famous, one thing. Another thing, it was a custom earlier that kings would encourage other people to write songs or psalms and ascribed, uh, they would ascribe that to their own name so that their name gets famous. This is the, the ancient Near East custom and even in many, many historical events we have seen how one person's literature is ascribed. But how we understand it, David? Traditionally, our church says many of the songs are written by David. And how we understand that? Psalms are, or songs are written by David. And the book of Song of Songs, especially the love poems that we have after the book of Ecclesiastes, it is like it's given as a Solomonic authorship, so the Song of Songs of King Solomon. So there are some songs that are attributed in the Bible to Solomon. They come part of Song of Songs. And there are some liturgical psalms or songs, they become part of David's authorship. However, besides that, we have some other psalms like songs by Asa, songs by sons of Korah, songs by Solomon, Moses, Ethan. So that's where we can say it is not one author but multiple authors. Uh, so that's why we say authorship when you talk about songs, we say it's multiple authorship, no single authorship. Good. Now the songs have been composed and they are in oral tradition. But now who composed that? or who collected that we can say, or who collected all the psalms and put together. That was the work of the community. So here, <laughs> another question is asked, like who inspires that community? And there, Carl Rahner beautifully tells, when we talk about the inspiration theory, often we tell that God inspires the word of God. So God inspires the community also to collect and compose them together. So this is the work of the Jewish community and this composition happens between 10th century BCE and 2nd century BCE which means uh, like a David's time let's see 10, 10th century is a David's time actual starting and 2nd century century where like a like a near Maccabean age so more or less the Psalms are attributed to this now we may ask how do they calculate this particular time and they calculate a particular time language the grammar for example we, we talk a language especially our own local languages telugu tamil hindi or konkani 
like one generation talks in one way another generation talks it in another way which means there is an influence of other languages as well so based on the grammar language style people say more or less this particular language belongs to this time so that's why we are able to say the composition lasted for quite a long time then we have the shortest psalm which we read this uh, before the class psalm 131 the longest psalm is psalm 119 so this is just for our for our understanding and some psalms are called as pre-exilic psalms and some psalms are called as post-exilic psalms for example psalm number 137 by the rivers of babylon where we sat down and wept so this is a, from the very the first line we can understand like a babylonian captivity it refers to so which means it's naturally a post-exilic psalm because they write that psalm after that experience of crossing that river and to babylon where they experience that the foreigners were telling that sing our lord song here but these people are telling how can we sing a lord song in a foreign land in a strange land so already we are able to correlate with the babylonian captivity and psalm so psalms of this kind are post-exilic psalms and psalms are like other kinds like the lord is my shepherd must have been in an earlier psalm this is how we classify pre-exilic and post-exilic good now how do we divide the book of songs or the book of psalms so many scholars say say different opinions some say all the psalms are put together at random so there is no connectivity from one to another that's one school they say all the psalms are independent though they may reflect one thought with another for example towards the end 140 to 150 we have all hallel psalms like hallelujah psalms in all the songs we will have a word hallelujah so they say like a, there is a connectivity but suppose you take psalm number 22 and psalm number 23 so in psalm number 22 there is a, like a uh, my god my god why have you forsaken so it's a kind of a total uh, desolation a person feels but in the next psalm a person feels total consolation the lord is my shepherd so there is no real connectivity so some say some psalms are connected some psalms are not connected and their view is simple that all the psalms are to be understood intra textual level intra textual level means the psalm has to be understood within the psalm for example psalm 23 has nothing to do with the psalm 551 or psalm 127 so this is how we understand each psalm is independent it's one school another school says no it's not put in a put on a row by uh, randomly or by chance so it has a development of the theme they say so how do they develop the theme they develop the theme like uh, the first one the author begins with one who meditates on the law of the lord and finally he concludes saying meditating on the law of the lord means praising god so this is how they develop the theme and that's called a canonical reading canonical reading means as it is put in the canon of the bible of the book of psalms we read and we find a kind of continuity but many authors say the continuity is forced because it's not a real continuity as we mentioned some problem there so they say it's like a forced thing but however many authors agree that we can divide the entire book of psalms into five categories based on the book of torah the book of pentateuch and the key word that is found is we have put in the bracket so the first section is psalm 1 to 41 where 14 and 13 it reads blessed be the lord then 42 to 72 blessed be the lord 73 to 89 blessed be the lord 90 to 106 blessed be the lord 107 to 150 blessed be the lord and based on this particular expression blessed be the lord in fact it tells a kind of a transition from one section to another section so the uh, many authors say like the book of psalms was composed as a parallel literature to pentateuch in the pentateuch we have five books and parallel to that we have five sections in the book of psalms 
and uh, in our new testament the second testament matthew also has a tendency to divide his book into five like torah because he present jesus as a as the new israel and the presenter of new torah new moses and there the key that he uses is after having said this so once jesus will say then there will be a formula after having said this after having said this which means there is a first completion and when the fifth section it finishes he beautifully says after having said all these things which means everything is concluded in the fifth book that's how matthew literary style follows and what else if we say like matthew has modeled after pentateuch and the author or the composer or the collector of the entire book of psalms has put more or less the section according to the torah good that is number one number two we go into introduction to hebrew poetry this is very simple and we need to understand a little bit so that we are able to understand the meaning of poems number one first we'll understand this particular two words compare jesus went up to the mountain to pray in luke 6 12 we have these words then in psalm 121 it reads i lift up my eyes to the mountains so what is the difference the first difference we can say the first text has something singular mountain and in the second one it is mountains plural that's a basic difference but other than that if you look at from a literary point of view the first mountain is literal literal means like a that is real actual jesus goes to the mountain like we have uh, different mountains mount everest or mount of temptation or mount of tabor so all these are real mountains but coming to the second one i lift up my eyes to the mountains does not mean the author simply raises his eyes to somewhere but he raises to the mount of zion so what is the meaning here is the word mountain is not literal but literary literary means it is used as a metaphor metaphor for what metaphor for zion or metaphor for the mountain of the lord so that's how we we differentiate so now in the hebrew poetry the psalms many psalms are having this particular literary element and we need to understand them to understand our real meaning otherwise we'll take the meaning in a literary way and there are two things number one parallelism number two word picture just a minute i'll just close my door thank you so the first element is parallelism the second element word picture we'll understand what is the parallelism so parallelism simply means in particular words the second line will be parallel to the first we'll do some examples and let's understand for the time being parallelism like one line being in parallel with the other and this could be word parallelism or thought parallelism so what is the meaning exact word will be repeated or a synonym will be repeated or a thought will be repeated that's a word or thought parallel and what is the purpose of this is the purpose of synonymous parallelism which we'll see three kinds is to emphasize the theme which means when you say it twice in fact you stress that because that's how the early early people when they compose a song they want to give emphasis means how do they give emphasis they just don't put it number two like twice you have to say no they say in other words which means the part the theme or the meaning gets close to our heart that's the purpose of synonymous antithetic and synthetic we'll see shortly so the first parallelism is called synonymous there are about nine parallelism but we'll see only three synonymous which is they are very common in the book of psalms look at the words here so we have here save me O lord from lying lips save me from deceitful tongues this is from psalm 122 and this is the second line we said the second line will be parallel to the first line 
so we call it now as a line but in actual literary circle they call it as a colon so this is first colon this is sorry second colon the first colon second colon goes parallel to the first colon how save me save me oh lord it's missing from lying lips from deceitful tongues look here this is save save the exact word is repeated but here meaning is repeated for example lying lips deceitful tongues so lips tongues they are closely related lie and deceit they are closely related and since the second one is parallel to the first one or the second one is synonymous to the first one we call it as synonymous parallelism so this is not only a for stylistic reason but also for a purpose the purpose is to give emphasis good we go to number 2 second example he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters psalm 23 2 here how the second one gets repeated he he makes me lie down lead me which means two directions so the sheep have to lie down and the sheep have to be led but the third one you see green pastures still waters they are closely related because where the water is very still there naturally the prosperity is more so the green pasture and still waters so which means what is the implication of this particular repetition here so which means the the abiding presence of the lord is always there so the lord does not abandon us so this is the message is given and the message is given in terms of repetition it's the purpose of synonymous parallelism we go to antithetic parallelism antithetic means we can say antonymous or antithetical like one in contrast to the other so look at these two lines in the first words they will collapse and fall we shall rise and stand and which means it talks about two people they and we so it's their contrast will collapse and fall we will rise and stand which means two opposing positions are given so what is the purpose the purpose is not emphasis because there is no repetition there is a contrast so the purpose is after portraying about two things so the reader has to choose which one i want to be i want to stand with them or i want to stand with us so that's how the reader has to make a decision and for this reason we have antithetic parallelism one in contrast to the other let's take one more example his anger is part for a moment his favor is for a lifetime here contrast anger favor or anger versus kindness for a moment for a lifetime which means something temporary something permanent so now the reader has to choose which one he or she wants to choose does he want to does she want to choose something momentary or that of lifetime so the purpose of antithetic parallelism is giving two ways to the reader and making that person to choose one and negate the other that's a second type of parallelism the third type of parallelism is synthetic parallelism synthetic means not something created like we say synthetic material now synthetic means synthesis like a one thought is extended and is completed by the other or the other line completes the first one look at the example here as the deer pants for streams of water so my soul longs for you or longs after you o god psalm 42 1 so here again we have two lines or two colla the first colon is as the deer pants for water the second colon is my soul longs for you so the second one in fact completes the first one so what happens as the deer pants for the streams of water my soul so longing of a soul is compared to the panting of a deer for water so which means one thought completes the other synthesizes the other that's why we call it as synthetic parallelism so that's the first type which we have when you read through psalms 
you can see like which type of parallelism is employed. And there is a kind of parallelism called staircase parallelism. Staircase parallelism is like one thought is built on the other. That's called staircase parallel parallelism. So there are different parallelisms. We have only seen only three. Then there are different word pictures. So first we'll understand what is a word picture. Suppose I say temple. The word temple immediately evokes an image in our mind. Suppose I say cake. The cake, as soon as I say the word cake, we get an image of the cake, either which we ate somewhere or which we cut somewhere or which we saw somewhere. So these many of the words are word pictures, which means as soon as the word is set, our mind creates a picture. And why these word pictures are employed in literature means the word pictures, like they connect two of our senses. Like they say in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, learning happens through our, the learners are of three types. Number one, visual. Number two, auditory hearing. Number three, kinesthetic. For example, I go to teach to the visual student, how they will understand anything they see will get registered in their mind. So what I have to do, the world is round. If I write that, they will, they will see what is written and they will comprehend it. But for the auditory student, they have to listen. The world is round, the world is round. So constantly repeat to them and it gets registered. And for a kinesthetic, kinesthetic is a movement. For that person, how I have to teach? I have to say, the world is round. So the world is round. When he looks at the hands, the movement of the hand, that person will understand. And in the word picture, what happens? I say a word, which means auditory. I say, I create an audition. Then the, there is a mental image, which means the learning becomes comprehensive, where visual and auditory, they go hand in hand. That's why many of the songs we use word pictures. One of the common word pictures is, the law is my rock. So you hear the word rock, our mind creates a picture. Here the word shepherd creates a picture. The Lord is my light. Here the word light, immediately our mind creates a picture. They are called word pictures. How these word pictures are at different types? We have four common types. Number one, metaphor. Like we say, the Lord is my shepherd. We'll come to examples. The second type is, simile third one is personification or the fourth one anthropomorphism like both some say they are closely related we'll see the example and before we see those metaphors today we talk about visual metaphors or you go to any airport or metro station bus station so instead of uh, uh, even for the person who is a non-literal person or a person who can't read so with the, with the symbols, they are able to communicate. For example, symbol of a lift or symbol of a restroom or symbol of luggages, packages. So with the symbol, they can understand. That's called visual metaphor. So look at the some, there are many visual metaphors. I have just taken two. Look at this visual metaphor. So we have an ice cream or uh, like a cone, but ice cream cone in that ice cream scoop, they have drawn the world the world means a globe and it's melting so what would be the meaning it simply means global warming so instead of saying that uh, the earth is getting warm and the ice are uh, icebergs are ice deposits are melting and the sea level is rising so that can be very communicated powerfully through this because it's an ice and it is affected by the the external temperature this is the it's a simple visual metaphor for global warming. Look at this picture here. One person is smoking and the smoke goes around the neck and in a way it makes a person like a suicide. It's a killing. So instead of saying smoking kills, so this particular visual metaphor communicates that when you smoke, actually the, the smoke which you smoke, in fact, tie around your neck. So this is a metaphor like instead of saying like don't smoke because it will kill you or uh, these are the evil effects of smoking. But it's just through a metaphor, through a picture, they are able to communicate. So they are called 
visual metaphors so we'll see some metaphors or some word pictures look at the first example as i said earlier the lord is my shepherd good so here how do we get the meaning so for this metaphors to understand i need to have a pre understanding and the pre understanding should be very common for example i say samson is a lion in battle that's how i make a statement so when i say samson is a lion what i am telling i am communicating a metaphor in the sense i take the strength of lion and attribute it to samson so when i say samson is a lion he does not mean that samson had four legs or he had the head of a lion so what simply it means is samson was strong or samson was a person of strength but suppose in my culture lion stands for meekness or lion stands for uh, for kind of a timidity so how would we say then immediately the the listener will say oh samson was a timid person or samson was a terrified person or samson was a hesitating person because there the cultural gap gap disrupts the meaning so in order to understand a metaphor both the listener and the speaker they have to be on the same cultural level otherwise there could be a misunderstanding of the meaning that's a very precaution we need to have so the lord is my shepherd so more or less our culture is not a shepherding culture right? even though there is shepherding is a profession animal husbandry is a profession cattle rearing is a profession but still uh, many of our people are of agriculture people but still agriculture and shepherding they go together so more or less we are able to understand but suppose you go to a person who has never seen a rock and you say the lord is my rock suppose the person is living in a kind of a marshy land or a very the ground is always damp and that person to understand that rock rock means he is solidity and how he, to understand that person should have a pre understanding so metaphors work only when we have a pre understanding when we say the lord is my rock it does not mean that lord can't be moved because a uh, rock can't be moved or the author does not say the lord is black like a rock is black or rock is reddish the lord is reddish no so what is emphasized here is rock has the solidity or that can withstand any temperature so which means steadfastness so which means god's faithfulness god's mercy is unshakable that's the meaning so when we understand a particular metaphor we need to see what is meant by the author when he used the metaphor that is number 2 third one i love you lord so here more or less like a the lord is made as a person because we say god is a person but still god can't be a person with like us like a body or like a hand or like our emotions but god god is god self but still a human person can propose as somebody proposes to a lady love i love you lord so this psalm is very unique psalm 181 only here in the entire bible we have human persons addressing god with i love you lord which means some kind of close relationship is established which means what is the implication there is a personification like it god is made as a person and love is expressed towards that person that is personification let's go to the next example simile in psalm 102 6 we have i am like a pelican of the wilderness i am like an owl of the desert look at the this particular sentence and number one so here it is not saying the lord is like a shepherd no or the lord is like a rock but here it is i am like a pelican or i am as a pelican so if uh, the words of comparison or particles of comparison like uh, as like or explicit they are called similes if they are implicit they are called metaphors look here there is no word as or there is no word like it is implicit but here it's explicit if it is an explicit it is simile if it is implicit it is called metaphor good then last but one the eyes of the lord 
are toward the righteous. Psalm 34, 5. So here, and the next one, let the rivers clap their hands. Look at this particular sentence, the eyes of the Lord. The Lord is compared to a human person who has eyes. Because now we talk about God as a trinity, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in the Psalms, there is no trinity because this is a song of a, a, the Jewish literature. So they don't believe in trinity. And their God is an abstract God. And But still, here, eyes of the Lord, which means as eyes of human person. So the anthropomorphic element, the anthropos, human person's element is taken and applied to God. That's why the eyes of the Lord. So here is called anthropomorphism. Let's take the last example. Let the rivers clap their hands. So only human can, human persons can clap their hands. But the author is saying, let the rivers clap. So what's the meaning? The waves of the river, as they rise, they make noise. In a way, author uses what is applied to human person to an impersonal thing or an object, a river, and tells that, let you also raise your voices or clap your hands. This is called anthropomorphism. Personification and anthropomorphism are closely related. Good. So just to quickly sum up, we'll take a three-minute break now. We'll take two things. Number one, we are given a general introduction where we explained about the meaning of the word psalm, the number of psalms, how they are divided. Then we went on to see two elements of Hebrew poetry. The first one being parallelism and the second one is word picture. We go to the third section, a survey of psalms. We'll see how many types of psalms are here. Earlier we said there are temple psalms or liturgical and pilgrimage, non-liturgical or paraliturgical, then human existential. So like a, where we categorize according to the content. But now, not only with the content, but the style or the composition, the structure, how we can divide. So the first type of psalm is called hymns. So some hymns are individual hymns, some are collective and some are praises to Yahweh. Let's take one example, Psalm 8, where it is said this psalm was uh, given to the persons who went to the moon. And <laughs> like here, the author in an evening sits outside and gazes at the sky and praises God for the beauty of creation. So this is an, this could be an individual hymn or collectively, like one person's individual experience becomes a collective common experience of other people. This is very well possible. Number one are hymns. Number two, laments are lamentations. Lamentation simply means an experience of a loss. So either you have lost a loved one or you have lost some which is very, very important thing or some failure or some kind of suffering which you undergo. Naturally, you lament over. So there are some lamentation psalms, for example, Psalm 12, Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is a famous lamentation psalm, which we'll be reading uh, through this uh, Lenten season, where it reflects, in fact, the pain and sufferings of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken? There's a lamentation. The third type of psalm is confident psalm or trust psalm, which means whereby a person experiences confidence in life that's one one possible meaning second that person places his confidence or places his or her trust on the lord and sings so which means the lord is my shepherd so where the author david places his total confidence on the lord and sings the psalm that's why it's called confidence or trust psalms the fourth type is thanksgiving psalm like a David escapes from his own enemy and there as a sign of thanksgiving, he sings this song. That's a thanksgiving song. There are very many thanksgiving psalms, especially the person who has recovered from an illness or who has returned back, returned to his own uh, home after a journey or who was at the deathbed and somehow recovered and is praising God. That's a thanksgiving psalm. Psalm number 34 is one example. 
And there is a kind of section called royal psalm. So you remember David, Solomon, they are all royal figures, the court figures, which means many psalms are like a royal blessing because in the ancient Near East literature, a king was considered as somebody descended from God. So God's representative is the king. So which means the attributes of God are ascribed on a king and are sung. They are called royal psalms. That's the fifth category. Sixth category is wisdom psalms, which we said earlier. Like some psalms talk about the Torah, the law of the Lord, and Psalm number 1, Psalm number 19, which in fact, entire Psalm number 19 talks about the Torah, talks about the law of the Lord. So these are called wisdom psalms. Finally, historical psalms, Psalm 133, where a particular historical experience is given expression, poetic expression. They are called historical psalms. Psalm 137 also, we can say it's a Babylonian exile, it's a kind of a historical psalm where it really portrays the pain that was and that people were undergoing in, in the Babylonian captivity. So these are the types of Psalms and this is a quick survey of Psalms. Coming to next one, Psalms in Christian tradition. Like Psalms, have, even though we need to understand the Psalms are not Christian in, the, in a real sense because they are Jewish. They belong to Old Testament, the First Testament the first testament is Hebrew Bible. Hebrew Bible is the Bible of the Jews. So we have just taken the Jewish Psalms into Christian tradition. How we have accommodated? Number one, Jesus prayed the Psalms. Like we have in the Passion Narrative, after the Last Supper, they sing the Hillel Psalms and go to Garden of Gethsemane. So the Hillel Psalms are from Psalm 140 to 150 the Alleluia Psalms, which means Jesus might have sung these songs. And we hear from the Gospels, like Jesus is present in the synagogues and he's preaching there. So synagogue worship is necessarily a psalmic worship. So they will take Psalms and pray with the Psalms. So that way, Jesus not only recited the Psalms at the, at the end of his life, but all along in his synagogue worship, he might have constantly be in touch with the Psalms. Number two, New Testament authors or the Second Testament authors were familiar with the Psalms. For example, Matthew or Mark, they are writing about passion narrative. So they say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it is Matthew or Mark who write this particular Psalm 22. Because John who was at the foot of the cross has a different words. He does not record this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what's the meaning? Even though John was there and John was there, maybe John might have heard what really Jesus spoke on the cross. Or Matthew, we don't know whether he was there at the cross, but how he records that in the sense, he takes the experience of abandonment of Jesus and interprets it in an understanding from the psalm. That's how we understand the New Testament authors. And even in Acts of the Apostles, when Peter makes a speech, when Paul makes a speech, they always quote from the Psalms. So the implication is the authors, and either Luke or Matthew or Mark, they are in touch with the Psalms and they, they use the Psalms in, in the Gospels. That's the second reason. Third one, fathers of the church, like Saints Ambrose, Augustine, and later Chrysostom, they were mainly preaching on Psalms. So we have Saint Augustine preaching a lot. And even in his confessions, he has a lot to quote from the Psalms which means they were familiar with the Psalms and they took Psalm as a Christian literature. Then number four, the office of readings. So we, for the diocese and, sorry, for the priest, it is compulsory that we pray the church, the divine office, the, the office of the church. So here we primarily sing Psalms. And in the midday prayer, in the midday prayer, every day we have a reading from Psalm 119. The Torah Psalm is repeated every day in the midday prayer, but other Psalms and canticles are taken from the Bible. Mostly the Psalms are in the Psalter. Then in the liturgy, for example, Mass. So in the Mass, there is an antiphon, that is a communion antiphon, entrance antiphon. They are usually from the Book of Psalms, like a, 
we say to like instead of that often we sing entrance hymn but as far as the liturgy is concerned there is an entrance antiphon there we, with that we can start the mass and that is usually from the bible from the psalms and in the mass in the proclamation of the word we have a responsorial psalm on all days on weekdays and sundays and solemnities these responsorial psalms are mostly from psalms in some cases they are from canticles canticle of isaiah or canticle of tobit or canticle from judges so we have different instances otherwise the most of the responsorial psalms are from the book of psalms then we have a blessing for example official roman blessing we have like a blessing of a vehicle blessing of a house or blessing of a person in all these blessing ceremonies we have a reading from psalm so that way our liturgy and paraliturgy they have adopted a lot from the book of psalms now finally how do we make use of this psalms for our prayer and most of us use for our own personal prayer we take a psalm reflect over it either during the adoration or during the meditation or even during a journey or even i have seen some people listening to the psalms being sung or being recited as they drive the car and now there is a tendency like people all want to listen in original so they take the original sung psalms are found in found on youtube hebrew or greek so how they we can really especially the song of uh, song 23 song 34 are they very beautiful when we hear them in real hebrew so we also could cultivate an interest to listen to them like it's a kind of meditative reading or meditative listening and how do we take it for a personal reading suppose we have we undergo different experiences one day we feel so great consolation another day we feel very low desolation then we feel confident one day then we feel failing one day so for all these occasions we can have support from the book of psalms so sometimes we may not read other books because they may not really appeal to us at times but when we read the psalm they really talk to us because they are all expressions of human experiences so they are not uh, not an impersonal experience but a personal experience so that's how they really touch us that's number 4 coming to number 5 psalms that are hard to understand are difficult to understand so these psalms like 59 83 109 137 we take only this example let's take here psalm 137 7 9 so the first part is okay like verses 1 to 6 we have no problem the rivers of babylon we we sat and they are very very beautiful like they say if you forget you jerusalem let my right hand wither and my tongue shall cling on to the the top of the tongue the the ceiling of the mouth we can say like a, on the palate which means so what's the meaning like i can't talk anymore so when my mouth is clung to it or when my right hand withers i have totally a uh, loss of power loss of energy so which means in that uh, instant take like i want to uphold jerusalem like uh, it's a kind of a nostalgia so these people are out of jerusalem and from the river side they look back into the direction and they really feel they cry and they cry and from that cry we get there and the second part is very disturbing the second part i read remember lord what the edomites did on the day jerusalem fell tear it down they cried tear it down to its foundations daughter babylon doomed to destruction happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us happy is the one who seizes your infants or babies and dashes them against the rocks it's really first one we'll understand edomites edom was a foreign nation but here actually the babylonians but still they use a kind of a bad bad word or a bad nation so it's a kind of a shaming or a demonizing vocabulary they use the jerusalem fell it refers to babylonian captivity and the captives they say tear it down tear it down to the foundations now it is addressed to babylon so here it is say it is doomed to destruction happy is the one who repays you which means you have done or you have uh, put suffering on us and somebody will put suffering on you so the kind of a vengeance is there so that somebody will take vengeance on you on the other hand 
happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rock which means so they don't say like you have to kill the infants so they simply say like your generation will be nothing or you will have no offspring which means you will be completely uprooted so which means out of their pain out of their depression they say and it's in a way like god will take vengeance on the people of babylonian babylonian but even though the people of israel sinned against god still kind of the lord later takes over and brings them back and lord in fact brings vengeance on the foreign nation especially assyria and babylonia so here how we understand from a liturgical point of view or from spiritual point of view god is not saying that we need to be violent violent to the babies no god never subscribes to that idea nor to the author say like the reader has to go and dash the babies against the wall no it is situ- right written in the situation or the context of pain pain which was which was in a way instilled on the people of israel by babylonians so they want revenge so a kind of a revenge or a vengeance text or a violence text we can take so that's how we we say that this has come into the bible even though this has a not so godly or not so spiritual element in it so because it simply expresses their their frustration or their depression we can say and ultimately it's not people who take revenge it's god who takes revenge that's how we can theologize the texts that are hard to understand and now the in the recent studies a study it's called intertextual reading earlier you remember when i said the word intratextual intratextual means one song read within that song intratextual but the intertextual means i read one text in relation with other text for example we have psalm 78 and exodus when we compare these two texts exodus plague narratives especially the moses aaron they are in egypt they are there are 10 plagues but there are 10 plagues in exodus but in psalm 78 if we calculate there are eight plagues so now the question comes which one was written first somebody wrote as a prose 10 plagues and later it was converted as a poetry with the eight plagues that's one argument some people say no it was only eight plagues were real as if they are written in the psalms later they were paraphrased elaborated and made into 10 and written in a prose form so we are not sure so in intertextual reading they try to see a b so here a is psalm b is exodus which came first a came first or b came first a influenced b or b influenced a or they influenced each other or they were totally different to each other this is how they establish in intertextual reading so just to make you understand this is the recent literature that has been being developed on psalms good let's come to the last discussion theological significance so when we read the book of songs we read different names about god like god is a general name for god lord is yahweh then there is an expression god of hosts or god of angels so in a way it comes from the isaiah text isaiah often talks about the lord god of hosts the lord god of hosts of course is actually a military vocabulary or a legion vocabulary it has come into the bible then often god of forefathers especially god of our jacob so jacob is ideally portrayed as a person representing the entire people of israel so god of forefathers or god of israel or so israel not necessarily people of israel it could refer to the person of jacob as well then we have many qualities of god like mercy faithfulness holiness justice redemption they are given key expressions in the book of psalms then we understand people in communion which means people were united when they sang the song that's why when our catholic church says that when we have to read the office of readings the entire church gets united because the psalm was an expression not only of an individual but also of a community so there is a community expression is there so when we pray the psalm we not only feel we are lonely but we get connected to other people people in communion then people as pilgrims so the psalms of ascent are psalms of pilgrim songs 
so they are very beautiful to sing so when we sing naturally our hearts get connected to god and in that section only we have a very beautiful blessing of the couple then we have like a at a funeral home we read so all these which means in the pilgrim season the all the stages of human lives are covered that's something beautiful about pilgrim so the implication is god is telling us that we are all pilgrims here on earth then the psalms also talk about social and ecological concern for example the psalm um, 8 it talks about moon sun and moon which means how we are able to relate to and uh, to external force which means the ecology so that concern also is bringing and also the social justice element for example 137 how the author wants that social justice of one oppression be taken vengeance is expressed these are all different uh kind of uh, motives are we can say social ecological justice and finally there are some motives or themes which are found exodus so all the pilgrim songs are more or less parallel to the exodus experience liberation experience then we have torah and the law then father child relationship or shepherd sheep relationship king people relationship god is considered as a rock god is considered as a cup of salvation so all these images tell us that God is always providential and God always takes care of us continuously. Good. So that sums up the book of Psalms.